press the middle. Yeah. So we're now up to Vav, the letter Vav, on page Ayn Resh Hay. We've said that there are three interpretations of the word Lema. In the passage for Adabra Lekim is called Vav Ayn Lema, in the introduction to the Aserus of Libris. One interpretation was that Lema means that when we learn Torah, Hashem responds. We learn Torah for Hashem to respond. Lamer, that he should say what we're saying. He learns along with us. The other interpretation is, Lamer means that no, when Hashem gave the Torah, he gave it in such a way that every time we learn Torah, it's actually Hashem speaking through us. We're totally nullified. We're just the conduit through which the words of Torah are coming. But it's Hashem speaking, not us. The third interpretation of Lamer is by Dabber, that the Seres Adibris were given in order to Lamer, in order to elevate the Saras of creation. So, we're going to now understand deeper what the connection between these three is, what the flow is in Vav. V'yesh Lamer, Habir Bazer, we can understand it like this. The Bamat and Torah Gimel and Yomim. That in the giving of the Torah, there are three elements. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, no son of Torah. There's Hashem, the giver of the Torah. V'Yisrael, Mekabli Torah. There's the Jewish people, the receivers of the Torah. V'Torah Atzman. And there's the Torah, which is what's been given. So there's three elements. There's the giver, the receiver, and what has been given. Hashem, the giver. The Jewish, <coughs> the Jewish people, the receiver. And the thing that's been given is the Torah. V'Chidush Ba Torah, Shinit of Matan Torah, L'Gabi Torah, Shalom Du Aavis. L'Fnei Matan Torah, Hu, Hen Ben Gela, Noisen Torah. V'Hen Ben Gela, Mekabli Torah. V'Hen Ben Gela, Torah Atzman. The Chidush, the revolution that happened at the giving of the Torah in comparison to the Torah that was learned before by the forefathers, the Chidush is in all three, both in the giver of the Torah Hashem, in the receiver of the Torah, the Bnei Yisrael, and the Torah itself, something changed. Which is, this is an amazing thing to say. Something changed in Hashem at the giving of the Torah, something changed in the Jewish people in the giving of the Torah, and something changed in the Torah in the giving of the Torah. As we said earlier, before the Torah is given, before fathers learned Torah already, they kept Torah, they learned Torah. It existed before the Torah was given. So what changed at Mount Torah, at Mount Sinai? So we're going to see a major change, change in all three levels. Both the giver, the receiver, and the, the thing that's been given is different from before and after. So let's see what they are. Shachidush b'negelen noisina Torah hu kedisa b'gemara. The Chidush, as far as the giver of the Torah, Hashem, is concerned, what changed, as it were, Hashem doesn't change. So what's the Chidush? The Gemara says, Shanoichi, the word Anoichi, the beginning of the Seres Libras, I, Anoichi, Hapsicha de Matan Torah, which is the very opening of the giving of the Torah, who Rashi Tevis, the, the word Anoichi actually stands for, Ana, Nashvi, Nashvi, Ksavis, Yehavis, I, my very self, have written and given. Anoichi stands for Ana Nafshi Savis Yehavis. I have my very self written and given over. Meaning, what does that mean? Da Ana Nafshi Hu Atzmusa Yisbara. I myself, I myself means the very essence of Hashem. But Pirush Ana Nafshi Savis Yehavis, and so what does it mean that I, my very self, have written and given myself over in the Torah? Who as the Er hat Aran geschrieben und Aran gegeben sich allein. Ana Nafshi. What it means is, in Yiddish it is translated here, that I have written myself in the Torah and given myself over in the Torah. Meaning, the Torah is an expression of the very essence of Hashem. He has put himself in his book of Torah and given himself to us. The Medrash puts it in different words. I've sold to you my Torah. So, as it were, I've sold myself with it. I've given myself over to you. So, it means that the giving of the Torah was not just Hashem giving something of His to us. It was He's giving His very self to us. The Torah is an expression of Hashem's very self. He's put Himself, His essence in Torah. And by giving the Torah, He's giving us His essence. So, so the change that happened to Hashem, as it were, in the giving of the Torah was that He's given Himself over to us completely. He's, he, it, it's like a, a very deep 
commitment in a re- in a relationship that uh, that he's given he's given himself over completely that I'm yours. I've put myself in the Torah and I've given it to you. Ananashi, my very self is given over to you. Before that wasn't. No, before there was there was no such level of connection. But I've given myself to you. The, the people who who reached out to Hashem, who tried to connect with Hashem, but for Hashem to give Himself to people, there's no, no such idea. Here it's the very essence of Hashem that has been given, written into the Torah, and given over to us. So that's the chiddush as far as Hashem is concerned. Then the chiddush ben Negeli Yisrael, the Kabbalah Torah. What's the what happened? What changed? for the Jewish people who are the receivers of the Torah. If for Hashem what changed is that he now belongs to us. He's given himself to us. What changed for the Jewish people? What changed in them? That what changed was that because at the giving of the Torah, the Torah was given to the control of the Jewish people. The power to decide halacha was given to the Jewish people. The Jewish people became the deciders, the source, the, the balabai, balabatim, who were in charge of, of halacha. Meaning, the ein mashgich and babaskol. We know, we, after the giving of the Torah, you ignore a heavenly voice. When it comes to halacha, if a voice comes out from heaven saying the halacha is like this, we say, that's interesting, but what do the rabbis say? <coughs> What, 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 is, what is the psak down here? The Jewish people decide halacha, not heavenly voices. We say to him, even more than that, there's even a case in the Gemara where Hashem says, my children have outsmarted me, they've beaten me. Because there was a famous story in the Gemara of where Hashem was saying halacha is one way and the sages were saying, the majority opinion says otherwise. And so, yeah, the, the, the final halacha is, is the loy b'shemaymi, the, the Torah is not in heaven, it's on earth. Meaning, the Jewish people have the power to decide halacha, not heavenly voices. Which is a, which is a very powerful idea. It means that, that the Torah was given over to the Jewish people entirely. Meaning, it's not, not that it's in heaven and on earth, but it's completely down on earth. To the point where Hashem himself cannot contradict it. Because it's, it's ours. It's given over to us. So the Jewish people became in charge of halacha. This was, was a change that happened to the Jewish people. That they became the ones who decide halacha. But how can the Torah change the third one? Oh, let's see. Bachir Shbunagel, the Torah atzma. What, what is different about Torah from before the Torah was given to after the Torah was given? That after the Torah was given, what happened at Matan Torah was that the Torah was given the power that when a command is given through the Torah, that command affects the person who hears it and the world that receives it. That the world aligns itself to the Torah's command. It wasn't there before? This no. before? And this wasn't before. This, it wasn't like this before. Let's have a Torah change? Yeah. The, 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 the Torah has new power. Right. We, 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 the, what, a, what a change in Hashem, that Hashem has now been given over to the Jewish people. That's what happened to Him. He now gave Himself to us, His essence to us. What happened to the Jewish people? We now have a, a power to decide halacha that we didn't have before. It used to be in heaven. Now it's given to us. And we have the power to decide halacha. And what happened to the Torah? That the Torah now has the power to determine reality. That, that what the Torah says, reality has to follow. Which will be explained further. What, is it, what does this mean? Torah, <coughs> the fourth last line. As it's explained... In the Kutai Torah, but no gel aseres adibros shunem of Matan Torah. In the Kutai Torah, speaking specifically about the Ten Commandments that were given in Matan Torah, but brackets in the Toichan, ha'inin sham muvin shal derech sehu ben gel acholat zivim di Torah. But from the gist of, of what the Kutai Torah says, you can understand that the same applies to all commands, not just the Ten Commandments, but all commandments. 
שנאמרו בלושן ציווי, וגם בלושן אסיר. The language of the Ten Commandments and of every commandment is that it is said in the imperative, it's a command, but the imperative could also be translated as a future, as a prediction, as a statement of, of what will be. Right, so for example, when it says, Lo yisirtzach, do not murder, you could translate that also as, you will not murder. It's not, just, it's not just lo sirtzach, that do not murder. It's not just a command telling you what to do, but it's a prediction saying what's going to happen. You will not murder. Because lo sirtzach is imperative in Hebrew. The imperative is also the future tense. P-L-O-L. All right. So, therefore, every command could be understood as a <coughs> command telling you what to do or a statement of the future. This is what will happen. So it says, "Shenem b'loshen tzivu loshen." Kamoi lo sirtzach shul tzivu v'gam avtocha. Lo sirtzach, do not murder, is a commandment, but it's also a guarantee, a statement of fact. You will not murder. Ki adibur atzma goyzer ala adam ba'olam upoel leim liyos kain. That the speech itself demands from the person, commands, and also decrees that this is what will be. You won't. You will not murder. That's not so. Oh, so how do we murder? How is it possible we murder? That, that's because you can go against reality. You can do something that is, that is uh, absurd. But Torah made it that you're, you're not a murderer. You will not murder. You can choose to go against your nature, to go against normality and, and murder. That, that you can always do. But, um, but Torah, what it's saying here is that Torah is not just giving you a command and leaving it up to you. Torah is giving you a command and giving you the power to do it. Every command is also an empowerment. <coughs> so if we're told, you should love the Lord your God, if we're given that as a command, it also means we're given the power to do that. We're you will love God. You will. You've got, you've got all the power to do it. It's been given to you. It, it, it's, there, it's there to be done. If you look at the note 45 in the bottom, it addresses this. You could say like this. As far as the creation is concerned, because the statement of the Torah decrees on a person and on the world that it has to be this way, so you have to be according to what the Torah says. If the Torah says... <coughs> you shall not murder, then you can't. <coughs> However, the fact that we have free choice means that you can go against nature. You can do something that is totally against the grain of reality. Meaning, what's the difference? Before the Torah was given, people murdered or didn't murder. Right? But why? Because you, might, you could do either way. People knew that you're not supposed to. Was it moral? Not to it was murder? immoral to murder. Was it? It was immoral to murder before the Torah was given, for sure. Yeah. That's why Cain was punished for murdering Abel. Because murder was wrong. It was always wrong. The difference is, there was a there was a moral ideal you shouldn't murder, and people had to choose whether they did or they didn't, whether they listened to it or not. When the Torah was given, when the Ten Commandments said "Lo Sirtzach," it became unnatural to murder. Murder is it's not really possible. If you want to be totally irrational, totally unreasonable, unnatural, and go against the grain of creation, you have the free choice to do that. And the same applies to Shammah, Hashem, Sure, and, yeah, and everything. So, Every command. So you weren't going against the natural way of the world before the Torah was given? You're the being Torah. immoral. You're being immoral, but... Is it an unnatural to murder? No, it, it, look at the world. It, look look, at, look at nature. Moral? Isn't it moral for the Torah? No, but there's, there's a difference. Before the Torah is given already, murder was immoral. It was the wrong thing to do. Oh. Because you're not supposed to murder. From the Torah? It wasn't a command. It wasn't given as a command yet. There was, oh. there was, there was, no, there was no command not to murder. There was a, a principle that, that, that you shouldn't murder. It wasn't, it hadn't been, Hashem hadn't come down and said, Lo Sirtzach. It doesn't say Lo Sirtzach before that. 
it says that a person who takes the life of another, you know, their life should be taken. Yeah. It says that already in the Tanayah. Yeah. But, but the command, you shall not murder, hasn't been given yet. So what does that mean? It's a moral principle, you shouldn't murder. That was around from the beginning of creation. That's why Cain was held guilty for killing Abel. It was wrong. It was always wrong. But was it possible? Was it, was it a part of the world? In the world of nature, why not murder? In the, in the animal kingdom, there's murder all the time. So why, why, why not murder? Because there's a moral principle saying not. When the Torah was given, something changed. That the Torah, the command the Torah gave, makes, it, makes the reality, determines the reality, and the reality is people don't murder. If people do, what are they doing? They're going against the nature of reality. They're doing something that's completely counter nature. Because the Torah said, you won't murder. People are murdering. So then they're, they're just, they're going, they're going against their own nature. Because we're free choice. So free choice means you can do that. So in other words, to, and this is only Torah after Matan Torah. Torah at the giving of the Torah had the power to, to ingrain itself in the, in the very nature of the world. And so every mitzvah is also a statement of fact. You will love the Lord your God. You, you will keep Shabbos. This is, this, is what, this is what you're about. You're not keeping Shabbos. Okay, so you're being unnatural. You're being weird. People can choose to be weird. So the Torah was like a tikkun for the sin of the uh, Eitzadot, kind of, because when they, with the sin of the Eitzadot, they, it was easier to actually do an, a, the possibility for doing a Vavis. Yeah. It was created. Yeah. When the Torah came, kind of No, the Torah came was in. before the world created. Yeah. Never went Matan Torah. Yeah. Just balancing it out. Yeah. So, so every tzibu, every command is also a haftacha, is a, is a guarantee, is a statement of fact. The, the word itself affects the person. That this is how you are. This is your reality. So, this means receiving the Torah at Mount Sinai, that all of our souls were there, it was not just hearing a message, it was not just listening to a list of rules, but it was changing the world, changing ourselves, that you heard the Torah now, so now you can't murder. Look at the brackets. Even though you might say, hang on a minute, we're, we're talking here about what is the Chiddush, what's the revolution, what's new about the Torah after giving of the Torah. But this <coughs> is saying what's new about the world and people after giving of the Torah, that people... <coughs> have been given this nature now not to murder. But that's not the Torah being new, that's people. The Torah always forbade murder. Just it was, when it was given, people changed. The world changed. But aren't we supposed to be here listing the Chiddush that happened to Torah, not to people? So no. Mikal Mokam, Kivin Shem Torah. The Shmo shall call Dava Mera la Torah. Pum Loshen Herah. Haria Chiddush ba Ofen de Herah sa Torah. So the Rebbe says a very profound idea. But no. Because the name Torah means instruction. And we know that the name of something denotes its essence in Hebrew. So if it's called Torah and it means instruction, that must mean what is the definition of Torah. So the chidush in the the way the Torah directs us, instructs us, meaning that the way it instructs us is in a way that it affects us, that defines what Torah is itself. Meaning this. The idea that Torah is called Torah, which means instruction. So... What's the big deal that the, the Torah is the only instruction in the world? There's many instructions. There's many, there's many books of wisdom. There's many philosophies and ideas. Why is the Torah specifically called the book of, of instruction? There's, there's many, many other forms of instruction in the world. 
What's unique and different about Torah? Look at note 48 at the bottom. It explains it. The the Zesha Torah, Dafka Nikris B'Shem Torah, Melosh and Hayra, the fact that Torah, Torah specifically is called the book of instruction. Afshe B'Kamer Chachmas Yeshtem L'Chur Gam Hayra is, even though there are many different wisdoms and philosophies in the world that also have instructions for life. Brackets, Ulahor, Memam Rezal, like even the Medrash itself, our sages say, Yesh Chachma Goyim Tamin, if somebody tells you there's wisdom amongst non-Jews, believe him. There are, there are many philosophies out there that have wisdom that are not Jewish. But yes, Torah begoyim al tamin. If somebody tells you there's Torah amongst the non-Jews, don't believe it. <laughs> what does that mean? What, there's no instruction amongst, amongst non-Jews? If Torah just means instruction, there's no instruction. What it means is this. The instructions in any other philosophy are a part of the philosophy Meaning, meaning, according to this philosophy, according to this way of looking at, at life, a person should live in this and this way. But that can't be described as an instruction to the person. Because it actually has no effect on the person. It's an instruction in the book. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily affect me. It's specifically Torah which has an effect on us. That a person who could choose the opposite and go against nature, however, the Torah is, is commanding you and giving you the power to follow it, that can be called instruction and nothing else. Meaning, what makes Torah unique over any other wisdom? Any other wisdom is a, a bunch of ideas in a book or, or somebody teaches you theories and, and instructions that can give you instructions as well. But that doesn't necessarily change you. That's the instruction. I have to then decide whether I follow it or not. Like when you go to a doctor, and the doctor checks you out and finds that you need to change your diet and start exercising and do, get more fresh air and sleep longer and gives you a list of instructions, this is what you need to do. So those are instructions instructions are what? According to medicine, according to the doctor's view of your health, this is what you need to do. Whether you're going to do it or not is completely independent from the doctor and his instructions. It's, that's up to you. You're going to have to go and do it. You could completely ignore it or you could listen to it. It, it might go either way. His instructions are his instructions. They're not, they're not yours. They're, they're two different things. There's him telling you to do it and then you're doing it. The Torah is not like that. When the Torah gives you instructions, it makes you do it. It's become a part of you. It's now ingrained in your nature to do that. It affects you. So when we, our souls, were at Mount Torah and Mount Sinai, and we heard the Sarah Sedibras, it became our nature to keep Shabbos. It wasn't just saying, you know, according to Torah, it's a good idea to keep Shabbos. Now, you'll have to go away and think about that and see if, you, if it suits you. No, when the Torah says, Zachas Yom Shabbos Lekadsho, remember the, the holy day of Shabbos, so that became our thing. Keeping Shabbos became our thing. We were given a Shabbos nature now. The free choice is you could ignore that, you could go against your nature, but it affected us, it changed us. It actually impacted us. And that's why Torah is called the book of instruction. Because you can have instruction meaning, I think this is what you should do. But that doesn't affect you then what Torah's instruction is that the Torah says, this is what you're going to do, and it becomes you. That, that, is, that is literal instruction. Literally getting you to do something. So, that's, so only when the Torah was given, it really became the Torah. Correct. Because, and, and the, the word Torah means instruction. When did the Torah take on this power of being the instructive work that gives over to people the power to do it, do it. that was at Mount Torah. So therefore, the Chidush, this Chidush is a Chidush in Torah. The Torah changed its nature. It really became Torah at Mount Torah. So I went from 
like passive to active. Like it was always going to do that, but yeah. it did it then. That's right. That's right. So, what about the other parts of Torah, like the begin, like Barachas, where things got created as a result of? So the Rebbe often said that everything, all of Torah is called Torah, which is Hayra, which is instruction. So therefore every story and every incident and episode in Torah is an instruction. There is some lesson in all of the stories of Torah. And they also are not just instructions telling us a bit of advice, but actually we're empowered by all of them. So when we, when we, when we read a story about the creation... So we have, to, we have to take out of it. So what's the lesson for us? What do we have to learn from that? And whatever that lesson is, is something that's ingrained in us as well. It's also, it's also terrorist. It's also Hera. So none of it is just history or background or, you know. Um, what I meant was, it wasn't like when the world was created through Torah, saying, Hashem saying through the Torah, let there be light. Light came into existence then. So didn't it kind of like, what wasn't it its instruction then being activated by... No, no that was the word of Hashem being activated. Okay. That's, that's, that's the Sarah Mamaris. Okay. That's the ten sayings of creation. Uh-huh. Ten sayings of creation created the world. That's Hashem yeah. creating the world. The Torah is a Sarah Sadibris, which, which brings us deeper, this deeper which power. Which is the third point. Yeah. So look at the next paragraph. A similar thing happens when Jewish people learn Torah. Not only when the Torah was given is this hurrah, this instruction power revealed, but even when we learn Torah throughout history, any time we learn Torah, the same thing happens. Look at the Torah Shem. As the Torah explains, When we learn the halachas, for example, of which animals have, have become treif, which diseases call, cause an animal to be treif, to be not kosher. And these ones are kosher, that, uh, that if, even if it has this, it's still kosher. When you learn the laws of kashras, for example, you have created a separation of, between the pure and the impure. By learning the halachas of it, you, cre- you have divided the powers of impurity from the powers of purity. Something has happened as a result of your learning. And all powers of evil have, uh, are then eradicated, are separated out and lost. Similar to what happened when Hashem said, the Sarasadibras, it scattered away all powers of evil. So, in other words... There's a, there's a principle that, that powers of evil can have no separate, independent existence. They have to be attached to holiness to exist. Holiness is life, is, is godliness. Evil has no source other than when it's attached to godliness. And one of our missions in this world is to separate the holy from the unholy. And by doing that, the unholy falls away. Once it's been separated, defined, recognized identified, so then it loses its power. It's only when unholiness is mixed in with holiness that it can have any existence, because it latches onto holiness. Once you've separated them out, then unholiness falls away. How do you do that? How do you separate holiness from unholiness? So one way is by eating kosher food. What are you doing by eating kosher food? You're saying, this is holy, this is kosher. You're separating it from the not kosher. So then the powers of holiness are strengthened, the powers of unholiness fall away. But there's another way of doing that, and that's by learning about the laws of, of keeping kosher. Learning what is holy and what is unholy, what is pure and what is impure. By just learning the Torah of it, it affects the reality that the powers of unholiness are loosened from holiness and they disappear. So there was no real impurity before the Torah was given? I'm sure there was. There was. But, but to, to separate it from, from it, you had to do something. Whereas after the Torah is given, just by learning the Torah of separation, you, you, you do it. So if, if you learn, that means you could learn the laws of sacrifices. There's a whole section of the Gemara and uh, in Rambam 
There's, there's halachas of sacrifices that become pure or impure, and all the, all the laws of purity as far as sacrifice are concerned. Completely irrelevant to us, as practically speaking. We don't have sacrifices. The laws of purity and purity, they don't apply to us. But when you learn those laws, you are separating the powers of purity and impurity from each other. And that is affecting the world, because as, when the powers of impurity are separated out, they lose their sustenance and they disappear. So every halacha you learn that tells you that this is kosher, this is not kosher, or this is pure, this is impure. Every time you learn that, you are conquering another evil power in the world. Because Torah has the power to determine reality. It's not just a, an idea you're learning, but it's a, it's a statement of fact. This is pure, this is impure. So it affects the world. Let's give another paragraph. Just to add another point. The chidush that happened to the Torah through Matan Torah, that it affects a change in the world, the Torah actually impacts the world, is even more emphasized in mitzvahs than in learning Torah. You see it in, even more in mitzvahs, meaning... Through the keeping of mitzvahs of the Torah, after the giving of the Torah. The physical object that you use for doing the mitzvah actually becomes purified and impacted. To the point where there's certain times when the physical object with which you do a mitzvah becomes a mitzvah object, a holy object that has to be treated with holiness. Not just when you're doing the mitzvah, but even afterwards. A pair of tefillin is not just holy when they're on you, when you're doing the mitzvah, putting on tefillin. They're holy objects that can't be put on the floor, that, that, that uh, have to be kept in a clean place, that, that, that actually have innate holiness to them. It's just a piece of leather. And when it's in a bag, there's no mitzvah happening with it. But you, you by, by doing a mitzvah with it, you've imbued it with holiness. The physical object now becomes holy. That's only after the Torah was given. Before the Torah was given, if you did a, a, a mitzvah, which the forefathers did mitzvahs, with, with an object, the object didn't become changed. The object was still just the, the, the tool you used. When you're not doing the mitzvah, it's not holy anymore. Whereas after the giving of the Torah, we have the power to imbue a physical object with holiness, even when the mitzvah is not being done with it anymore, it's holy. So like, like the body, like we've learned before. Right. Yes. Correct. Correct. So there's two levels of this. There's a chesed shal mitzvah, I feel a chesed shal kedusha. So tefillin is called a chesed shakodush. It's something that actually has innate holiness. Um, a lulav is that called a chesed shal mitzvah. That a lulav you couldn't, you can throw out, but you have to throw it out like this. It has to be wrapped separately. It can't be disgraced. Um, it's a lower level of holiness than tefillin. Tefillin becomes innately holy. You can't throw it out. Is that because there's Torah in it? Yeah. It's because yeah. there's actual Torah inside it. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas whereas the lulav is not has a holiness that there's a sanctity to the lulav, and therefore it has to be disposed of respectfully. It can't just be thrown with the rest of the garbage. But it's not like tefillin. Is that because you've done the brah? You've made it holy? Yeah. yeah. So if you have a lulav uh, two days before Sukkot, if you want, you can throw it away. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If you didn't use it, okay. so it's just a branch. What about two days after? If you've used it, yeah. Yeah. Then it's, yeah, if you've used it, then it's called chesed shal, shal mitzvah, it's and has to be disposed of respectfully. Mm-hmm. But the bottom line is, it's still just a branch. It's not sukkus anymore, and it's just a branch. So, what's it? What's it worth? You know, like, you, you could, no, it's a chesed shal mitzvah. It's, it's had a mitzvah done with it, so it has sanctity. So, so just to revise this, this what we just said that the revolution of Matan Torah affected all three, the giver of the Torah, the receiver of the Torah, and the Torah itself. The giver of the Torah was affected because Hashem, in giving of the Torah, gave himself to us. His self now belongs to us. He's, he's, he's ours. Af, an, nashi, he put himself in the Torah and made himself totally available to us. So that's, that's totally new. It affected us, the Jewish people, in that after the Torah is given, we are the ones who determine halacha. Torah is ours, and we decide what the halacha is. That it's, that it's our power to, to determine halacha. It's not in heaven anymore. It's, it's down here on earth with us. And, and thirdly, the Torah itself was affected, that after the giving of the Torah, the Torah is able to determine reality. That when the Torah says something, it is. 
And the Torah says, don't murder. So we're not murderers anymore. Naturally, we're not murderers. To, to murder, you have to go against nature to, to murder, because it's not, it's not normal anymore. Even when we learn Torah, Torah has the power to determine reality. When we learn a section of Torah, it affects the world. And certainly when we do a mitzvah, it imbues the physical object we do the mitzvah with, with, with holiness. So all three levels are affected. Okay, stop there. We're going to continue.